You're tuning into the Real Estate Diversification Podcast, hosted by trusted and experienced real estate attorneys who are also seasoned real estate investors themselves. Are you ready to explore unique real estate investing opportunities? Ready to learn about emerging trends and new ideas? Your hosts will help you understand the practical and legal complexities of a myriad of real estate investments so that you can maximize your potential and achieve financial freedom. Now, listen in and get ready to learn. Get ready to learn. I am your co-host today, Jonathan Gilmore. Uh, today, I am joined by Doug Rainey. Doug is an attorney at this firm, been here for about a year. Doug has a unique experience I'm excited to uh, hear about today, and I know you will be as well. Doug's background is in the single family development uh, field, and today he's going to talk to us about this asset class. So welcome, Doug. Doug, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background before we dive into the topic? Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. So basically shortly after uh, graduating law school back in 2010, um, had an opportunity through a family friend uh, who knew about uh, some raw land uh, that was being liquidated by a golf course, his holding company. They were selling the course and um, several parcels of raw land um, in uh, Lawrence, Kansas. So, um, you know, we, we just kind of figured it was right for development. The The housing market had been slow for a few years. You know, this was shortly after the 08 crash. And, you know, there was quite a bit of pent up demand. So uh, we just decided to dive in. You know, we kind of built out our team and put together our business plan and um, went forward. So you, you mentioned the kind of macroeconomic factors. I, I was, you and I are about on the same timeline as far as law school. And I remember, you know, in 2009, that it was, it was tough going from a, from a job perspective. And I realized, you know, I wanted to be a real estate attorney at that time. Uh, it wasn't a lot of work. So what kind of gave you the, the, the idea or um, just the impetus to just jump on something, even though we're still in a recovery mode, it felt like at that time. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, a, a lot of it was just trying to take advantage of the price, you know, just we, we knew that we were going to buy it um, at a heavily discounted price just because, you know, they were motivated to sell and real estate prices were so low. And, you know, it was mostly just trying to time the market. You know, we had a feeling that, you know, eventually people were going to need somewhere to live. And so few um, new homes have been built over the prior several years that uh, we just kind of predicted that the market would be you know, going back up based on that. And, you know, it was very much a guess. It was an educated guess, but it was a guess. But, you know, fortunately, we, we guessed correctly and, and the market did start to bounce back. So, you know, we we're able to, you know, move those lots fairly quickly. Oh, that's excellent. So, so, so you decided you were approached by a, a, a friend, a friend of the family, and kind of where does it go from there? I mean, it seems like it's a sure. big undertaking. And just for the audience, you know, my background, uh, I spent several years uh, as in-house legal counsel doing land acquisitions for a publicly traded home builder. Uh, I did land acquisitions from Phoenix to Jacksonville, so I kind of understand what it takes, and it's a it's a heavy it's a it's a heavy lift. So for those interested in investing in this asset class, like, Doug's got a unique experience. So I'm just kind of curious, where do you start? Yeah, well, so a lot of it is just kind of a back of the napkin analysis. Um, you know, just kind of looking at you know, what's it going to take to acquire the land? Um, what's it going to take to put in all the infrastructure? What's it going to take, you know, in terms of human resources, all the consultants, you know, engineers, lawyers, all of the above, you know, to get you across the finish line and, you know, estimate a rough timeline on how quickly you think you're going to sell these lots, you know, what's it going to cost to service debt and kind of go from there and start, are we going to be able to offer, you know, a reasonable cash on cash return to our um, investors? So, you know, we're, we're pretty conservative. We, we tried to be um, conservative in both what we bring in and, um, you know, not underestimate uh, all, all those expenses. And, you know, even after all that, we thought we had a pretty good deal. So, so the most important thing is, is, is that, you know, just make sure you're not missing any expenses, they're going to sneak up on you and make sure you're kind of realistic about, you know, all of the above. Because, um, you know, one of the biggest things is banks were very leery at the time because a lot of them had to foreclose on a lot of developments like this. So I think we had to pitch this deal to probably 25 different banks. Mm -hmm. um, and we had maybe two or three offers to choose from out of those uh, 25. You know, a lot of them just said no. So, um, 
you know, that, that was certainly a lot of it was, was getting the uh, debt financing. And then on the other end of the equation is uh, the equity side. You know, we, we were able to get about two thirds financed through, through a bank, um, all of whom, you know, wanted a recourse loan with, with guarantors. And that's pretty standard these days. So, you know, then you have to pitch it to, um, you know, your equity side, which really comes first is, is getting your equity side on board. That's, you know, believes in the deal enough to want to sign that kind of note. Um, and, you know, for if the deal goes south, that they're willing to, you know, hold the bag for, you know, potentially several million dollars. So um, those are kind of the main two parts of the equation is, is pitching your, you know, your investors on that sort of deal and then, um, you know, getting it financed through a bank. So, yeah, I can imagine the, the lift on that. So you mentioned before part of this is kind of a, you, it went from back of the napkin, it sounds like, to, a, you know, plan slash pro forma for just the equity yeah, side, yeah, it, for the, the debt side. So, Exactly. So, you know, once you kind of get your um, investors on board with the, you know, the general idea of it, of course, then they're going to sign the actual, you know, bank document. So, you know, once you kind of get um, your, your investors on board when you're pitching to banks, yeah, you, you'll put together a more detailed business plan, you know, a lot of uh, tax returns, financial statements for everyone involved, um, any limited partner owning at least 10% generally, you know, that can vary from bank to bank, but that, you know, that's pretty standard. Um, certainly all the general partners involved, you know, they want to see that and, um, yeah, just kind of a more detailed projection of all the expenses and all the revenue. Um, yeah. so, you know, our, you know, and, and then you have to kind of decide what's the business plan going to be in terms of what are you going to sell? You know, our, our approach probably more so than most single family developers, um, was to sell dirt. You know, we, we would put all the infrastructure in, you know, after we bought the land and then just sell, uh, the lots to other builders, whereas, you know, a lot of developers try to keep all that in house. And, you know, a lot of developers, the, the developer will be the only builder, you know, you won't even have a choice um, on or, on who you uh, build with. Whereas, you know, with our development, you pretty much build with whoever you wanted, you know, we had a builder as part of our uh, general partner team, but the significant majority of the lots in our development were actually built by other builders. Uh, who turned out to be our biggest buyers. You know, we had, we had a handful of um, end user buyers, uh, some of whom used our builder, some of them used other builders, but probably 80% of our lots, we just sold to our network of, of builders. So that, that's why I recommend if you get involved with this sort of investment, uh, before you get too far into it, uh, network with your local home builders association, because, you know, whether they're your direct buyers or, um, you know, their, their own built buyers, customers, you're going to want a lot of your development, uh, it's it's certainly in the uh, developer's interest to have a good relationship with as many home builders as possible. That's a good device. So you know you you mentioned you back you know, had a had a good uh, low land basis, right? You time in the market, and you did so correctly, by the way. So well done on that. Then you moved into debt and equity and and raising capital. Uh, you've kind of talked about your your plan, your projections. You had mentioned kind of the team, right? So yeah. What does that look like? Um, what types of personnel do you need? Um, what was what? What did you realize? You know, hey, maybe we could have done better on this. You know, if on the next development, or maybe hey, we should have had this person sit in this spot. You know, I always think about consultants and and what that means and yeah, you know, how you use them. So so, can you speak a little bit to the types of team members you brought in, consultants and otherwise? Yeah. So. Our, our key consultant really was our, our land planned architect kind of doubled as our general consultant just because, you know, he had been through this process so many times. So that's the first thing I'd say, you know, is if you're interested in, you know, being a developer yourself on, you know, a deal like this, first of all, to really take a look at the land and make sure, you know, that the numbers work, you know, is why is it for sale? Is the price rise, is the price negotiable? And, you know, terms, you know, making sure that, you know, if you can get an option, that's a lot better than just buying it outright. You know, we were able to give ourselves a full year's option uh, for, you know, I think maybe half a percent down, something like that. So, but uh, getting back to your question about the team, um, just kind of a general consultant that's been through the whole process, I, I would say is really helpful. Uh, one of our general partners uh, is a home builder and general contractor highly recommend having something like that on your team. If it's not an internal person, like it's one of the partners, I would recommend trying to find someone like that uh, as a consultant, just because they're going to help you analyze your bids. In general, when you're putting your pro forma together, you know, you're going to rely on your engineers, who's another key part of your team, um, to kind of put together some, help you with cost estimates. 
your general contractor will really be able to kind of help you with that. And, and in our case, we were generally able to negotiate the lowest bid down an additional, you know, 20, 25%, um, just because they had a good sense of what every part of that bid actually entailed and what it should cost, you know, based on the local market. So uh, that will definitely be in your best interest because, you know, that obviously that's going to help your margin tremendously to be able to negotiate those costs down. Generally, um, I mean, it depends on the cost of the land, certainly, but at least in our case, uh, the, the infrastructure was about double the cost of the land. So that's going to be by far your biggest expense. Um, you're going to want a real estate lawyer. So, so definitely bring them in early in the process. Cause you know, our, uh, you know, I was fresh out of law school. So our, our lawyers helped identify some issues, um, that, you know, we didn't. So that's certainly going to help you things like drafting easements, drafting your, you know, restrictive covenants, uh, things like that, uh, that that's a, you know, key part of your team. Another thing is a real estate agent and, your your commissions on all of your lots is are actually going to be one of your biggest assets. So, I, I it helps to have someone like that in your team internally that kind of sees those commissions as part of the compensation for you know when your general partners. If you do need to go you know outside for your real estate agent, I would certainly recommend negotiating that because that you know three percent of the you know, or six percent usually it's going to be split down to three. Um, of, of your gross sales is a massive, you know, chunk of revenue just to be handing out to some outside agent. So I, I would certainly recommend finding a way to to keep that in house if if at all possible. And uh, you know, I don't know if this is something you could call part of your team, but we tried to develop a strong relationship with the local uh, planning staff at the city as early as possible. And you know, our, our consultant helped us with that a lot, but. That I would say is a very important part of your relationship just to get this city staff on board with your project because, you know, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have pushback from, you know, the neighborhood, um, you know, your surrounding, you know, neighbors to, to your development and a lot, you know, a lot of questions get asked at the planning commission stage, city commission stage. So um, having a working relationship with city staff kind of rather than you're feeling like you're fighting them, um, it's going to make it a way easier process. You're, you're, you're very much fighting an uphill battle if uh, city staff recommends uh, you know, denying your project. It, it's just a lot harder to get planning commission approval and city commission approval if city staff has problems with your project. Well, and you, you brought up a great point. Uh, just to let the listeners know, there's there's a few, way to buy, few ways to buy uh, single family development land. You, you had mentioned some of what you're buying, you're selling to individual builders, right? You know, from a land acquisition side, as you know, so in this in this instance, you bought farmland, right? It was was it zoned agricultural at the time, and you had to rezone it to single family to residential. Is that is that is, is that what? Yeah, our, ours was a little bit unusual where uh, there was already some zoning in place. Ours was kind of a mixed use development between neighborhood commercial. I mean, we're still getting through some of the the commercial side of the development. the The residential side is is long gone. But but what you described is is, is a more typical process where it'll be zoned agricultural and then you'll go through the whole rezoning process but at any rate the, the process we went through it was the same thing where you have to have a preliminary plat that your you know your engineers will will be doing the the heavy lifting on that and you know submitting it to city staff and then you'll have you know planning commission review and if you get through that eventually city commission review um but uh, you know, fi finding your engineer is going to be very early on in the process after you get the financing side figured out. So you, you had an engineer involved early on. You um, sounds like you had someone on the city side who, who you could help navigate. You had a, a GC consultant who had, you know, had this, you know, rode this rodeo many times before. So you kind of had a team in place of knowledgeable people that you could work with on the outset. Um uh, and, and, and just to touch on this, you know, this is a this is a zoning, this is an entitlements project, right? You've got to have entitlements done before there's a, a you know, single family developers can buy at uh, final plat, right? So or even pre plat really, but where the dirt hasn't moved, but you've got plats that, you're, that the engineer has drawn, right? And, and it's said, hey, there's 100 lots. Here's where the roads are going. Here's where the horizontal infrastructure, I'm talking sewer, water, et cetera. Um, and then another stage you can buy it, which is what your, some of your builders did, which is finished lot condition, right? So there's grading that's happened. 
you get it basically, you know, topped off, you've got roads in uh, and that horizontal infrastructure. So really you're just buying the, the, the dirt that's ready to go vertical on, right? So um, it sounds like you've offered, you offer that to some other people. Um, I can tell you from, from my experience that the entitlements is, and kind of what we're talking about, the, the risk profile for entitlements is, is uh, um, it's much more risky than buying a finished lot that's already been through the city, which can, can be a problem, right? I mean, I've seen deals, you know, die at planning commission. I've seen, you know, yeah. city council flip, um, you know, in entitlements uh, hearings. And, uh, and so there's a little bit of a risk there. That's, I think that's part of the reason why you said find someone who's on the inside who you can, you know, at least yeah, talk to it, and help it, navigate it. Yeah. And, and we had votes against us, the planning commission stage, you know, we, we were five Oh at the city commission stage, but you know, our, uh, you know, the, the neighbors to our project, you know, we, we scheduled neighborhood meetings to try to, um, smooth things over as much as possible. But, you know, at the end of the day, they, they hired an attorney to, you know, fight our project. And, you know, we, I, th I believe it was 6-3, you know, that we got through um, the planning commission. And at that point, you know, we were already tens of thousands of do dollars deep. So, you know, certainly something you'd want to disclose to any of your investors that, you know, there's a risk that um, it's going to die at the planning commission stage or, or it, you know, at another part throughout the process. You're, you're not going to get all the permits you need. Your uh, preliminary plat's not going to get approved. So, um, you know, of course, you want to limit your expenses as, as much as possible, you know, and ideally, I'd recommend not taking down the land. Um, certainly, you know, we didn't but before you got hit you get, my, that was my next question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that, that that's kind of where that option comes in handy is just kind of convincing the seller, hey, you know, if you want to sell this, you got to kind of work with us here because, you know, we can't commit millions of dollars to buy this raw land only to find out that it's worthless to us if we can't, can't get our preliminary plat approved. So, um, you know, fortunately for us, the seller was motivated enough to sell that they were, you know, willing to sign the preliminary plat and all that while they still own the land. Um, and then, you know, once we got through and our financing was fully in place, we're able to go ahead and exercise that option and close. But uh, certainly I'd recommend against putting the cart before the horse and buying this land playing. Okay. You know, here's what we're going to do. And then you get shot down by the planning commission or city commission or anywhere else in the project. And you're stuck um, owning land, you know, with debt attached to it that you can't develop. So yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's a, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point. And sorry to jump in there, but what I've seen is, you know, the sellers are selling that basis is, is higher, right? Because they're selling to be, single family uh, lots, which is a higher basis than if they're selling farmland in, in most situations. So you're buying it with the basis of expecting to get these entitlements approved. And, and there are some aggressive home builders. I, I would say that you've seen, and this probably hap what happened in 2006, seven, eight, right? Where you've had people get real aggressive. They're buying before pre-plats approved and maybe yeah. they get approved and then it's worthless. But a lot of times what you said, what can happen is you don't get it approved at all. So yeah, you've got a very inflated high with, with debt ridden uh, land on it, um, which is why a lot of uh, builders will buy on at the very least a pre-plat approved. Um, I happen to know several who buy on final plat only, right? So, yeah. and then, and then to, to your point, who's doing the entitling now? Well, that's where you got to give and take. Is it, is it, you know, me as the potential investor buyer, I'm paying for all the entitlements and it could be you know, hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars with a consultant and a legal team, et cetera, to get that through commission to get it final plat approved. Um, am I paying the landowner to do that? Sometimes developers own the property, right? Um, and it's very rarely our farmers develop, you know, getting it entitled. Sometimes they do, right? Um, but who's doing it? And then what also comes up a lot is who owns the rights to those plans? You know, you you, you just spent, you know, you've got an engineering, a consultant. You know, it sounds like you own the rights to the plans, but you didn't own the land at, until a certain trigger and, you know, a certain hurdle was met. And then things kind of changed a little bit. Yeah. So. And, and that's all negotiable, you know, in terms of whatever agreement you, you know, you have with the landowner. But yeah, I mean, to, to the extent that you can, you know, keep all the rights to your engineering and all, any third party reports, anything like that, you know, the, the better off you're going to be, you know, just to kind of. You, you don't want to unnecessarily add a bunch of value to the seller's land um, that you're not going to end up buying just because if you need to, you know, amend your contract, change the terms, you just give yourself more leverage that way. Cause you know, if you've already dumped, you know, let's say $50,000 and added value to the seller's land and Hey, you know, we need to negotiate an extension, you know, to our option, something like that. There's going to be significantly less motivated to, to grant that to you if they know that they get to keep all of your engineering work that you've invested into their property. So that's right. That's right. Something yeah. to consider up front. 
Yeah. And, and, and to that point, you know, timing, uh, we saw, you know, during the pandemic that even if you had everything, all your ducks in a row, the city was only meeting, you know, half or a quarter what they were. So everyone got pushed out. And sometimes the contracts this is the seller, right? If you're representing a seller and as a, as a lawyer, we've both been in this position where they want to know, when do I get my money? Right. When am yeah. I closing? When are they hard on the earnest money and in entitlement deals? It's a longer process, right? Because it's like, yeah, you might be hard on your you know, initial earnest money deposit, but uh, that's not really where the deal can come into problems, right? It's a year later, right? It's when you yeah. think the plans are going to be approved. And in the pandemic, we saw, oh gosh, our timeline's off. So, you know, we have got clients who are renegotiating those timelines at a price sometimes, right? Because now that leverage has switched to the seller side. Well, and that's why I always like to recommend, and, and as you know, we do this with all of our clients generally is, you know, don't just use the broker's form. You know, if you're making an offer on listed property, don't, don't just, you know, go with the broker's form. You should draft your own contract because that way you can bake in all those terms you want, you know, that a lot of sellers don't really read with a, you know, fine tooth comb, but, but matter a lot. Uh, not the least of which is that that option language, you know, because you'll have times where the sellers kind of sees the dollar amount. They're like, okay, great. But they don't realize that, hey, you're giving yourself plenty of time for minimal money to basically, you know, roll the dice on putting this deal together. You know, when we first signed this up, we didn't have our financing in place. We didn't have, um, you know, any city approval, certainly. And we just kind of say, okay, well, we're willing to, I, again, I don't remember the exact earnest money deposit, but it wasn't a ton relative to the size of the deal. You know, let's say five, $10,000 what, for what ended up being like an $8 million project between the land and infrastructure cost, uh, just to kind of roll the dice on putting that together. And fortunately, we we're able to, but it was a situation where, you know, we had our seed capital from our um, investors. And if the deal had fallen apart at any stage, we, you know, we could have walked away and we would have lost, you know, the earnest money. So I would say negotiating your, yourself as much time for as little earnest money as possible is, is going to be certainly in your best interest. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. So just to recap, at, the, at this stage, you know, you've, you've, you've got an option to buy, you're going through zoning, you've got everything approved, right? And whether well, that's pre plat or final plat, you get the approvals you need. And then at some point you've purchased the, the property. So mm -hmm. you're on the land, you've got the approvals. And now it's kind of like, what's next you know it's development right so mm -hmm. what did you know you mentioned restrictive governments like did you approach that kind of like at the same time as you're doing development laying down easements i mean you said you had a commercial component to this how many yeah phases did you have i kind of was just curious like what happens after that and what happened to you and, and what so, you so we had three phases and, and there's some pros and cons of, of splitting it up so the, the, the advantage to do everything all at once in one phase is you're going to tend to save on infrastructure costs so you know, I think we had about 55 total acres, um, of which about 15 was commercial and the rest was single family residential. And um, almost always in these mixed use developments, the residential sells first and then the commercial follows. And that, that's certainly what happened to us. We decided to split it up just because of the market. Um, you know, Lawrence is a, you know, it's a college town, about 100,000 people. So it's not necessarily going to have the same, you know, demand for, new construction as Kansas City would, for example. So we didn't want to basically compete against ourselves by flooding the market with, you know, 40 acres of single family residential. So we started with um, a little over half of our single family inventory. And, you know, that, that just, again, it, it, it took advantage of the fact there wasn't much else out there. So, you know, it yeah. um, kind of kept the price up. We, we did take the, the business strategy of pricing very aggressively right off the bat, just because, you know, like a lot of uh, limited partners, our investors were concerned not only um, return on investment, return of investment. So they're, um, and, and particularly getting, you know, the bank note, how to, you know, paid off. Because again, everyone involved that was at least 10% had to personally guarantee a, you know, multi million dollar note. So the, um, and, and I, that's even more true today than it was when, you know, we started this back in, you know, 2011 or so is, you know, prime is quite a bit higher, you know, so if you're going to, you know, be undertaking a project like this with interest rates where they are right now, first, I'd want to use that as leverage when you're buying the land, you know, try to negotiate the price of the land as low as you can, just saying, hey, you know, no one's going to pay you top dollar right now when debt is as high as it is. And I would also kind of take the approach 
you know, unless you can really afford to, you know, ride the wave is just to try to knock out that debt as quickly as possible, even if it means, you know, charging 20% below market uh, for the first third half, whatever the development, just to get the banknote out of the way. And, you know, and at that point you can maybe hold out for more money because, you know, there's always the risk that market's going to tank. Um, you know, let, let's say that, you know, we were lucky that the demand went up shortly after we bought the land. Let's say it had crashed even more, you know, when 08, you know, turned into the next great depression. Um, you know, if that had happened, you know, we're in trouble. So you just kind of take some chips off the table by getting your, your bank note paid off. And, you know, your investors obviously aren't going to be thrilled if they don't get a, a good return, but that's a much better case scenario than defaulting on your, on your bank note. So that's at least the approach we took. I mean, but I, I would say that's probably even better advice today than it was when we did it just because of, you know, higher interest rates. Yeah. Well, and to that point, you kind of touched on it earlier is, you know, there's a, there's phases as far as development, um, but there's takedown phases, you know, some, yeah. some development, uh, to some developers, some home builders will say, Hey, look, we want to buy 300 lots, but we're going to buy them, you know, hundred lots at a time, you know, so yeah. um, that minimizes their risk. Um, and then you've got, you know, now you're really relying on the engineering and, you know, what's spinal, what's, what's required, you know, is anything in phase three needed now? Um, and a lot yeah. of times the spine rows, something like that. So and, that's a good up. point. Yeah. And that, that's a really good point is we did install some arterial infrastructure, you know, sewer trunk line, for example, was a big one. Some of the infrastructure that we would need for all three phases, we did up front just because there's an efficiency there, you know, because every time you bring all those crews out, construction crews for your you know, contractors, it's going to cost money. So, you know, for some of those, it made economic sense to um, put that in, even though it was, you know, four years before we knew we'd actually need it, just because it was a lot cheaper to, to do that all at once. So, so you, you've, you've got the horizontal you're working on, you know, you're getting ready to, you've, you've got it platted. So we know where the homes are going to go. And, and so when do you get, did you build a model? I mean, you said you had different builders. So were there multiple builders with models? How do you control what types of houses get put in there? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, our builder contractor partner had a pretty good sense of, you know, who built what. And we kind of wanted to set the, the right tone. I mean, there's a lot of really successful builders um, in town that just tended to address a different price point than what we wanted for, for the development. So we actually said no to a couple of different buyers that built perfectly adequate homes just because we knew that they weren't the exact type of home that we wanted to, to have go in, you know, especially early on. So, you know, that, that's a big part of it too, is we did not do a model home, particularly just because our business model is more selling lots than it was um, building finished homes. We, we did do a few, um, but that's just not the approach we chose to take. I mean, again, a lot of builders do, it's just not what we did, but if you are going to sell to other builders, you know, we did what we called an architectural control board where we essentially gave ourselves veto power over everything that was built. Just because again, if, if you, you know, build a, you know, hideous neon green house with, you know, crazy architecture early on, it's going to dramatically lower the value of the rest of your development. So, you know, we just kind of want to, and we weren't, you know, we want to make ourselves easy to work with. We certainly didn't want a reputation for, you know, nitpicking exactly what went in, but we just kind of wanted final say to make sure that nothing went in that was going to, you know, lower the value of the rest of the, the development. Now, now to, to touch on that, did you hand it off to an HOA at any point in this development? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, so I mean, that, that's something some developments do. We had restrictive covenants, you know, that kind of said, you know, you can't build a shed of a certain size. And, um, you know, we, we basically just kind of relied on our lawyers and our consultants to you, you know, base that off of other developments that they, they've worked on. Um, but we chose not to go with an HOA. Um, I, I've personally invested in single family houses that had HOAs that made them a lot harder to sell. People just tend not to like them from, from my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not only you have to pay a monthly fee, but you just kind of give your neighbors um, a lot of power over your own property. And a lot of people just don't like that. So yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. it, it depends on the market, depends on the area, but um, we, we just chose not to go that route. Yeah. Well, and uh, it's a good point you say that because uh, in some developments, uh, you, you you might be required by the city to put in, a, you know, a fully amenitized, you know, amenity center, pool, et cetera. Yeah. And then at that point, 
you know, if there's not a metro district or something like that, you, you're you're really beholden and, and have to create an HOA because there's going to be a payment component of that, which comes with all the trappings that you just said that were in a lot of ways can be negative. And we all kind of heard you know a lot of horror stories about HOA or experience them, uh, yeah. which I have as well. So, yeah. um, well, and, and I just want to touch on, uh, just kind of wrapping up here. Um, I'm going to be doing a multi-part series on residential development. So, uh, whereas this is a great to hear kind of the, the overview from, from Doug today, I'll be talking about, you know, what you need in the due diligence phase will be, you know, survey engineering phase one, soil reports, how to get through building permits and, and, you know, joint development agreements, how to work with other home builders, things like that. So that is uh, coming. If you want to learn more about that, um, we are going to be releasing a multi-part series. So Doug, any other things, any other tips that you would say for someone looking to either uh, invest or just kind of generally, you know, be a general partner in, in one of these deals as we move forward? Yeah. I mean, so I would say if you're going to be a general partner, just the, the key is the team, you know, because you, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, dive in and make yourself the steward of, you know, millions of dollars of your investors' money without um, knowing what you're doing. So I think just the key is bring on people that have done it before, you know, it, it, and so the, the, the key is, um, you know, just to build out a good enough team where your main job is to put out fires and just have everyone, you know, doing what they're doing and kind of overseeing all that, um, you know, kind of the best way to uh, you know avoid mistakes. And, you know, from a limited partner's perspective, if, if someone approaches you with the deal is just to, you know, really ask all those questions up front, you know, make, make sure that the, you know, general partner uh, with whom you're concerned investing um, has answered all those questions, you know, that they know why they're buying the land that they're, you know, buying that they've really looked at the market and, um, all their pro forma assumptions are reasonable, you know, based on that market that they really have a good sense of debt and, you know, the schedule of, you know, projected sales and all that, um, rather than, Hey, you know, this looks like it'd be fun to develop. So, um, finding a general partner that, you know, knows what they're doing and has that good team together before you give them the money, I'd say is uh, definitely important. It's great advice. So, hey, Doug, thanks for sharing your story today. I know it was a lot to talk about. We could probably talk for hours uh, uh, on this, but uh, appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone for joining us today. And as always, invest wisely. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to the Real Estate Diversification Podcast. Did you enjoy the episode? Visit www.rediversification.com to tune in to more exciting episodes and free information and tools that will help you succeed. Leave us a review and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and our other social media channels at the RED Podcast. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you next time. Missouri Bar Advertising Disclosure. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.